How many people here are entirely new to meditation? OK, cool, a few. Um, how many people here are new to uh, compassion and heart practices flavor of meditation? OK, cool. Um, how many people are horrified and scared at the idea of sitting for 45 minutes straight? It's OK to be honest? In these specific terms? <laughs> <laughs> sitting where you are. <laughs> OK, so there were two brave people who raised their hands. I'm going to guess that there's probably like a 3 or 4x shame reduction factor. Um, so what we might do is we might... Uh, we'll break it up. We'll break it up a little bit. We'll do 20 minutes of one flavor and then 20 minutes of another flavor and uh, leave the option for Q&A if people want to. But if there's no questions, we can also just hold the Q&A till the end. Is that, so does that work for everyone? All right, that sounds cool. Hmm. All right, well, you want to jump in? Sure, hello. Uh, Thank you again for this invitation. It's so great to be here. Excellent. Um, makes me very happy. And uh, for Lindsay, who put in so much work, I'm sure, to make it all happen, and to all of you for coming. So what we thought we would do was um, really what was just described. I'll, I'll give a very, very brief overview of uh, different kinds of meditation. We'll do one. We'll take a break. and see if you have any questions or comments in that break, and maybe not, and then we'll go on and do the other kind. Um, and then we'll just have fun together and, and dialogue and, uh, and being together and, and further questions. So um, I went to India to learn meditation in 1970. Uh, I'd taken an Asian philosophy course in uh, the university I was going to. And the program, the university also had a program like an independent study program. And if you created a project that they liked, you could go anywhere in the world. And, and I had this uh, kind of strange uh, desire to learn how to meditate. So I created a project. I said, I want to go to India and learn meditation. And they said, OK. So off I went. I came back in 1974. Um, with the encouragement and actually insistence of one of my teachers to teach. So I came back as a teacher. So uh, that was really the beginning of, of many things. And in those days, one never heard the word mindfulness. And if you said you were, as I would in some social situation, uh, people would say, what do you do? And I'd say, I teach meditation. It would be kind of like, oh, that's weird, uh, which is very, very different now. So. Um, the, there are lots of ways of slicing and dicing and categorizing meditation practice. I always think of meditation as a skills training, and primarily in three different qualities. One is concentration, so that we're less scattered or distracted, less fragmented. We feel more of a sense of presence and wholeness and uh, focus. Uh, one is mindfulness itself, which feels like the word of the hour. Uh, classically, it means a quality of attention so that as we pay attention, our perception's not so distorted by bias. Uh, we're not laying on um, so many preconceptions or old fears or assumptions, and uh, we can get much closer to our experience in that way without so many veils intruding. And therefore, mindfulness. Uh, is considered the basis for insight or wisdom, because we can get so much more connected to things as they actually are when we're not, for example, taking the present moment's experience if it's difficult and projecting it into a seemingly unchanging future, like what's this terrible thing going to feel like in a week? It's going to be worse, you know, and, and so on. So um, that's really the skill of mindfulness. And then compassion and loving kindness uh, is like the third great skill of meditation, and it is considered a skill, which is often in the West considered kind of peculiar. It's a little bit kind of cold or mechanistic in some ways. Uh, we think, like, the idea of training and compassion is uh, it's just off-putting. And I don't know if it's that we tend to think of compassion as a gift, and you've either got it or you don't, and if you don't, you're out of luck, or it's like a spontane seemingly spontaneous emotional response. And, there's nothing you can do. But um, another way of looking at it from the point of, point of view of meditation is that c 
compassion is like an emergent property of how we pay attention. And if we shift the way we pay attention, so for example, we're not overlooking someone or looking through them, we're discounting them, we're actually looking at them, then because of that different quality of attention, there will be a different sense of connection and therefore compassion. So it too is a kind of attention training. So uh, in terms of the larger ways of practice, there's some practices that really are largely about cultivating mindfulness where our goal is not to have a particular experience at all, but to change our relationship to whatever experience comes up. So we're more present, we're more aware, we're more balanced, and there's more insight that can develop. And that's the first practice that we're gonna do. It's very kind of, many of you I'm sure are very familiar with it, a very classic practice where you start with awareness of the breath, which um, is, certainly not the only way to lay a foundation, but it's such a common way in part because as my early teachers would say, uh, first of all, you don't have to believe anything in order to feel your breath. It's not tied to any kind of dogma or, or faith tradition or lack of faith tradition. If you're breathing, you can be meditating. And then as one teacher said, I always found it very charming, he said the breath is very portable. So, you know, we come together, it's like a formal, uh, determined sitting, we're gonna, okay, now I'm gonna come together and sit with people. And we get used to coming back to the moment and coming back to ourselves using the vehicle of the breath. And then you're at work or you're in traffic or whatever it is. Uh, you have that means of, of returning. Um, and the other set of practices which we'll do next while they involve to a certain degree the development of mindfulness and a, a greater clarity about our experience. I, lar I call them sort of like the stretch. And that is a sense of realizing that our attention can be highly habituated in certain ways. And we're just gonna see what it's like. It's like an experiment. We're gonna see what it's like when we step outside the confines of that ordinary way of paying attention. Uh, and that's that whole group of concentration practices based on compassion and, and loving kindness and so on. Um, they're not meant to be pretentious and weird and phony, which is often the, you know, the feeling like, ooh, that, that's a little off-putting. But um, in truth, I think they're pretty radical because it, it's like taking some risks with our awareness in ways we don't necessarily do. So for example, if you think about that person, you normally look right through because they don't count in some way. What happens when you look at them instead of through them? Or if you're the kind of person who at the end of the day is looking back at yourself through the day and you pretty well only remember the mistakes you made and the things you didn't do really perfectly and what you could have done better, let's just say. No idea what you're talking about. No, nope. <laughs> uh, no one ever does. <laughs> and then the stretch is not to pretend, oh, I had a perfect day, I did everything magnificently, but not to be limited by that, right? To include also, wow, I have that to be grateful for, or I did that well, or there was that goodness in, in what came my way, right? So both sets of practices, the mindfulness practices that help bring us closer to our experience, and those practices which are like experimenting with awareness are based on inclusion. We include experiences in a field of awareness. We include more and more beings in a field of connection. Okay, so uh, rather than my saying more, we'll practice some and then we'll, we'll get into some discussion. So, uh, all right. Um, don't look at that clock, <laughs> whatever you do. <laughs> Um, so to begin with, we're, we're going to do a, a sitting uh, based on primarily on mindfulness practice. And interestingly enough, the core value of this kind of practice is said to be balance. Unlike other pursuits we might engage in or other endeavors we might have where we get into a kind of acquisitive, almost grabby kind of mode like, well, if I have a great sitting, I can leave at the break, you know? <laughs> Instead, the work is to bring our system into greater balance with the belief that out of that balance will come the insight and the 
the growth and awareness and so on. So, so that some of that balance is experienced right away in our posture. You want some energy in your body. You want to see if your back can be straight. But I'm like so much energy, you're really hypervigilant and you're all uptight. You also want to be relaxed, but not like so relaxed that your way slumped over as though you couldn't care less. So see if you can feel your way into what feels like a balanced posture. And you can close your eyes or not, however you feel most at ease. If your eyes are open, they can also be like a little bit open. You can find a spot to rest your gaze, let it go. And if you get really sleepy, sometimes happens with your eyes closed, you can also just open your eyes and continue on. Very often we start by listening to sound. It's a way of relaxing deep inside, allowing our experience to come and go. And of course we like certain sounds and we don't like others. But we don't have to chase after them to hold on or push away. Just let them come, let them go. It's like the sounds wash through you. And bring your attention to the feeling of your body sitting, whatever sensations you discover. Bring your attention to your hands. See if you can make the shift from the more conceptual level, like our fingers, to the world of direct sensation. Picking up pulsing, throbbing, pressure, whatever it might be. You don't have to name those things, but feel them. And bring your attention to the feeling of your breath. In this system, it's just the normal, natural breath. Wherever you feel it most distinctly. You don't have to try to make the breath deeper or different. See if there's a place where it's strongest for you. Maybe at the nostrils or the chest or the abdomen. If you find that place, you can bring your attention there and just rest. See if you can feel one breath. without concern for what's already gone by, without leaning forward for even the very next breath. Just this one. If you like, you can use a very quiet mental note, like in, out, or rising, falling, to help support the awareness of the breath, but very quiet. So your attention is really going to feeling the breath, one breath at a time.
of sounds or images, sensations or emotions should arise, but they're not all that strong. If you can stay connected to the feeling of the breath, just let them flow on by, your breathing. It's just one breath. But if something is really strong, you get lost in thought, spun out in a fantasy, or you fall asleep, you get really disconnected from the breath, don't worry about it. We say the most important moment in the whole practice is the moment after you've been gone, after you've been distracted. That's the moment where the training actually takes place. We practice letting go gently. We practice beginning again. Maybe you have to do it again 10 seconds later. Doesn't matter. We let go. We begin again. Just shepherd your attention back to the feeling of the breath. And if you have to do that a few billion times in the next few minutes, it's OK.
Isn't that amazing that no matter what happens, we can always begin again? Maybe you went far, far, far away for a good long time. It's okay. It's what one of my teachers called exercising the letting go muscle. We practice letting go. And with a full heart, not feeling diminished or that we failed, we start over. That's my new bell. I had to use it. It's so beautiful. Okay, do you have any uh, questions about anything you experienced or anything I said or um, any comments? And then we'll go on. Yeah. <laughs> not necessarily the most famous or the yeah. famous, but, but you know, yeah. what your experience was in uh-huh. So uh -huh. Okay, so the question was, um, uh, since I had used the phrase, my teacher or my teachers, especially I had one teacher, this woman named Deepama, um, who was not famous, you know, uh, and she was not a celebrity. Somebody wrote a book about her. Uh, the second version of it, I think, is called Deepama. Um, and it was very interesting because unlike some teachers, she was most remarkable really for her presence. And so it was a little hard to write a book about her because you didn't have like the, the illuminating sentence that changed your whole life or something that you really wanted to be able to share. But it was just like, wow, she was the most loving person I ever met. Um, Deepama was one of my early teachers. Deepama is a nickname, means Deepa's mother. Um, and she was the most, she was the person actually who told me to teach. She's the reason that I became a teacher. Um, she was uh, most impressive to me, really because of her story. She was a woman who'd been through tremendous suffering in her own personal life. She'd. Uh, been put into an arranged marriage when she was 12 years old and uh, she and her husband actually fell deeply in love and then they didn't have children for about 18 years and uh, then they had three children two of her children died and then one day her husband died really suddenly um, he just wasn't feeling well and he died by that afternoon and by that evening and uh, she still had one daughter Deepa to raise but she was completely grief stricken she just went to bed she couldn't get out of bed and they were living in Burma because her husband had been in the civil service and um, the doctor came to see her and he said to her you're actually going to die of a broken heart unless you do something about your mind you should learn how to meditate and she got up out of bed and she went to the retreat center and uh, she learned how to meditate. And when she emerged, um, it's like she'd taken all of that suffering and all of that pain and she turned it into enormous compassion for everybody. And uh, she was just the most loving, amazing person because she knew for all of us, our lives can change on a dime. And there was no one left out of her, her sense of love and, and connection in, in a very um, ordinary kind of way, you know, like oh, you know, did you uh, have enough tea? Would you like some more tea? Would you, uh, you know, and it, the lack of self 
preoccupation was so remarkable because I'd often look at her and think, well, if I'd been through what you've been through, you know, would I like care about someone else's tea? Maybe not, you know, but she had used all that in a, a beautiful way. So when she told me to teach, it was 1974, and I went to say goodbye to her in Calcutta. I was coming back for what I was absolutely convinced was a very brief return to the United States before I went back to India to live the rest of my life there uh, being a student. And she said, when you go back to America, you'll be teaching. I said, no, I won't. And she said, yes, you will. I said, no, I won't. And she said, yes, you will. I said, no, I won't. And then she said two things that were really extraordinary. One was, she said, you really understand suffering. That's why you should teach. Um, and I'd never thought of like the personal pain I had gone through as having been a credential for anything, really, you know. Uh, you really understand suffering, that's why you should teach. And then she said, you can do anything you want to do. It's just your thinking you can't do it that's going to stop you. And I left her, her room thinking, no, I won't. And I came back to the U.S. and began teaching and more invitations would come and more invitations would come. And, uh, one day we established this retreat center in Massachusetts and uh, somewhere after that I thought, ooh, I guess I'm not going back there to live after all. I guess I live here now. Anybody else? Well, maybe I'll use her, which is a wonderful feeling, thank you, um, as uh, the introduction for the loving kindness meditation. Um, because I think also uh, in, in this society, we can think of kindness and loving, I mean, loving kindness is a weird word anyway, we don't necessarily use it, but even compassion. Um, as uh, weakness, I mean, uh, someone told me, if you Google, compassion, very quickly fatigue will come up. You know, compassion, fatigue. We think of, of kindness often as a secondary virtue. It's like if you can't be brilliant, and you can't be courageous, and you can't be wonderful, and eh, be kind, you know, it's nice. <laughs> it's not great, but it's good, you know, it's good enough, kind of. Um, but I think of somebody like Deepama, and it is great. It's a great, great thing to encounter that kind of caring energy from somebody where you really feel they're not in it for themselves. They're just wanting to help or be there or be present or, um, or just the energetically that field um, is so amazing. And I don't think of her with a kind of scorn like, uh, couldn't do anything else with your life so you became loving. You know, <laughs> it's like, it's a very different quality of appreciation that I think we actually do have when, when we think maybe about people we've encountered or, or so on. So uh, one of the problems with mindfulness practice uh, is the word and the words that get associated with it, like accept things the way they are, you're going to be with your experience without judgment. It can sound so passive and so complacent like you're you know, you're just going to sit there no matter what. And so it takes a real exploration to understand it's a dynamic, vital relationship. Like once I was teaching somewhere and I started the instructions in the same way, like sit and listen to sound. And somebody immediately raised their hand and said, well, what if it's the sound of the smoke alarm I hear? Should I sit here and be mindful of the sound of the smoke alarm or should I get up? And I said, I'd get up. You know, but just hearing the words, I'm going to accept things the way they are, can sound a little dull, you know, like that. And of course, there are tremendous problems with words like loving kindness and kindness and, and compassion. And I think it takes, that, it demands that same kind of exploration and experimentation to get a, a deeper sense of what's meant. I think of loving kindness as an acknowledgement, a very deep acknowledgement of the connection that exists. It doesn't mean that you like somebody. It doesn't mean you're going to take them home. It doesn't mean you're going to give them all your money or any money. Um, it means this almost like bone deep acknowledgement that our lives have something to do with one another. And so many things bring us to that understanding 
you know, certainly environmental consciousness brings us there, or even epidemiology brings us there, economics brings us there. What happens over there doesn't nicely stir over there. It ripples out over here, and what we do, it matters because of those waves of connection. It's just the nature of things. And so it's not always pleasant, but it's true that our lives have something to do with one another. And the lived reality of that, the heart's response to that, is what we mean by loving kindness. It doesn't mean you're forcing a certain feeling or emotion uh, that isn't really there at all. It, it's more that, that sensibility um, that, that real, real sense that everybody counts, everybody matters. Uh, maybe my favorite expression of loving kindness came when I was teaching uh, in Washington, D.C. It was in this rented space, which was an elementary school. And they had the rules of kindness on these sheets of paper along the wall. And my favorite, favorite rule of kindness, things like, you know, respect everyone on the inside and on the outside, but my favorite rule of all of them was everybody gets to play. Everybody gets to play. Not every, everybody's not my best friend, but everybody gets to play. So that's very much the sense of loving kindness. And we practice in the way I described, not forcing a feeling or trying to pretend you feel something you don't, but kind of stretching our awareness to pay attention to the people we usually ignore, to consider the good within ourselves instead of only the mistakes we've made. We kind of play with our awareness in various ways to see what, what might then follow in the, in the nature of, of care and, and compassion. So in this practice, instead of centering our attention around the feeling of the breath, we center our attention around the silent repetition of certain phrases. Um, the phrases may not be the most predominant thing in any given moment, that's fine. You may have like a very strong sense of the being you're offering loving kindness to. Uh, you may have an emotion or not coming up. But the phrases are like the bottom line. It's what we can keep returning to, to have a place to rest our attention. And the phrases are uh, the conduit for our attention. It's the way we're paying attention in a different way. Uh, the phrases are words, and therefore they're going to be imperfect. So I usually suggest to people, choose good enough phrases. You know, so they're not bothering you, um, even if they don't seem absolutely perfect. The idea is to choose phrases that are kind of general so that you're not constantly thinking, like, what about you? May you be happy? Well, I don't know about you. Like, you get really lazy when you're happy. Maybe, may you be content? No, content's even worse. You'd really go, you know, it's just like, because the power of the practice is going to be from the gathering of all of our attention behind one phrase at a time. We want to keep things simple, right? Again, it's like letting go and returning um, is the movement of the, the practice, and that's how it, it develops uh, through paying attention in different ways. The construct, the grammatical construct of the phrases is usually may I and may you. May I be happy, may I be peaceful, may you be happy. May you be peaceful. Some people don't like that. It sounds too much like pleading or imploring. Uh, one of my friends told me, um, she told me it was the hortatory subjunctive part of speech. And she said, it's like you hand someone a birthday card and you say, may you have a happy birthday. May you have a great new year. It's a blessing. It's a gift. It's, it's actually a generosity practice. It's gift giving. We're giving ourselves that quality of energy. We're giving someone else that quality of energy. Okay, so the basic bookends of doing the practice are starting with yourself and ending with the extension of loving kindness to all beings everywhere, to all of life. And what you do in the middle might be different all the time. You know, maybe you have a friend who's in trouble, so you want to include them, or someone you feel very grateful to, you want to include them, or whatever it might be. So I'll guide you through just one variation of the many possibilities of, of doing it. So again, if you sit comfortably and you can close your eyes or not. <coughs> Let your energy settle into your body.
see if there are three or four phrases that work for you as that sense of gift giving for yourself and ultimately for others. Common phrases are things like, may I be happy, may I be peaceful. May I live with ease, which means in the things of day-to-day -day life, like livelihood and family, may it not be a struggle. May I live with ease, may I be happy, may I be peaceful, may I live with ease, or whatever phrases you want to use. And just gently repeat them over and over again with enough space and enough silence so that it's a rhythm that's pleasing to you. All kinds of feelings may come and go or none, it doesn't matter. The power of the practice is in that complete wholehearted presence behind one phrase at a time. Think of somebody who's like an embodiment of loving kindness and compassion. Maybe you've met them, maybe you haven't, maybe they exist now or historically or even mythically. And imagine that being offering loving kindness to you. And put yourself in the position of the recipient. And again, all kinds of feelings may come. You might feel embarrassed. You might feel entitled. All kinds of things. But let them wash through you as you steady your attention on the repetition of the phrases. Maybe it's that being or someone else comes to mind who's been like a mentor for you, a benefactor for you. They've helped pick you up when you've fallen down or maybe they've inspired you from afar. And if someone like that comes to mind, you can bring them here. Get an image of them. Say their name to yourself. Get a feeling for their presence and offer the phrases of loving kindness to them. Give them that same gift. Again, even if the words are imperfect, it's okay because they're the conduit for the heart's energy.
and then a friend, the first friend who comes to mind. Bring them here. Again, you can get an image of them or say their name to yourself. Get a feeling for their presence and offer the phrases of loving kindness to them. And then everybody here, including yourself. May we be happy. May we be peaceful. May we live with ease, or whatever phrases you may be using. And then all beings everywhere, all people, all creatures, all those in existence, near and far, known and unknown, may all beings be happy, be peaceful, live with ease. Okay. Awesome. <coughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, <coughs> Does anybody welcome. have any questions about how the practice or how the practice went, and then uh, 
Uh, so we'll just pass this around as needed. Okay. So, for the loving kindness practice, at the very end, <coughs> meditating for all days, I get the basic idea, but I always have this nagging question, which is that, you know, especially if you're talking about creatures, as, as long as, instead of just humans, they're like, well, some creatures are going to be eating other creatures. I know. And so they're not both going to be happy at the same time. So, <laughs> you know, I need to repeat the question, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so the question was uh, uh, kind of a discomfort at the offering of loving kindness to all beings because it's basically illogical, uh, you know, that especially when you're offering loving kindness, say, to all creatures, since creatures eat other creatures, they're not all going to be happy at the same time. That is totally true. Uh, sometimes I think of loving kindness practice as landing us right in the center of a paradox. Um, and sometimes I think of it uh, as it, it's meant, really, um, to um, the arena of transformation of loving kindness practice is our field of intention. It's how we are relating in terms of inclusion and exclusion, uh, in terms of noticing or ignoring, um, in terms of opening or shutting off. You know, so the, that's the transformation, and so that's our test. You know, it's not easy and it's not going to happen. Uh, but nonetheless, our own commitment in life is to include rather than exclude and to recognize the suffering of beings. It's, that is a part of nature. It's a part of life. And to ourselves not be causing more harm to the best of our ability and so on. Um, and it's also, it brings us to what's a really exquisite balance uh, that's often talked about between, say, loving kindness and compassion on the one side and just equanimity on the other. It's like, yeah, this is the way things are. Um, and there's a kind of poignancy in that, uh, in that, you know, I often, I often say and feel, uh, it's too bad it's not my universe to control <laughs> because it might be better <laughs> if it were, at least I think it would be. But it's not. You know, whether it's an immediate situation, one on one with a friend or a colleague, or it's kind of more um, uh, global look at the nature of things, um, we want beings to be happy and we can't make it so. And yet we need to do what we can do. That's not a you know, call for passivity, but what we do needs to be done in that context of understanding. You know, can't make it so. Yeah. Do you want to? Uh... <laughs> mm -hmm. We'll just repeat the question. Yeah. You use the same phrases as you present. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the question was about, uh, or comment was that I had used the same phrases as we move through different categories, and so is that the suggestion, or would you alter them as different beings come to mind? Mostly the recommend. Well, here's a balance point, you know, which is very interesting. Uh, I think in any meditation, there's a balance that's talked about between tranquility and calm and concentration on the one side and alertness and energy and kind of aliveness on the other side. And we're always working with that balance because we want both. We want to be more tranquil and calm, but not like so tranquil and calm that we're in a stupor. Uh, and we want to be alert and interested and connected and learning and investigating, but not so much so that we get agitated and restless. So uh, in every technique, in every method, we work around that balance. And uh, especially sometimes in loving kindness practice because it's so active and because these are real beings and relationships are complicated. I tend to encourage a lot of work on the kind of tranquility, calm, concentration side because there's almost nothing easier in that practice than to go off with a lot of energy in a story, you know, like, well, I thought you were my benefactor and it worked for a while, but 
Then I remember that one time when I called you and you weren't really there for me. So maybe you're not my benefactor. Maybe you're my difficult person. You know, maybe you're in the wrong category. I don't have any benefactors. Oh no, I'm so forlorn. You know, um, it's very easy because these are you know relationships are complicated. We're complicated, and 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 so we're bringing that right into the meditative arena, and. Uh, so it's not to the exclusion of having that aliveness and um, kind of spark. It could never be. But I just think it's good to have a sense of structure and simplicity that we can keep returning to. And so that would argue for the same phrases. You know, so you're not sitting there thinking, what was my phrase again? You know, like, um, and yet, sometimes someone will come to mind and they'll almost bring their own phrases with them. So you just switch. You know, it's not going to be one of those like uh, agitated sessions. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Thanks for coming. Uh, so, when you talk about the comparison between loving kindness meditation and, and mindfulness practice, do you find that? The difference between the two is a different end goals in mind, or strictly personal preference, or when there is a good time to use one compared to another? Okay, so the difference between uh, mindfulness practice and loving kindness practice, and do they have different end goals in mind, or, or just different kind of style, styles of practice, and uh, when is a good time to use one or the other? Um, they are actually designed for different goals in many ways, but not to the exclusion you know, the complete exclusion of the other. Um, it's almost like there's a primary goal and then there are all those attendant results or, or consequences that will come along. So the primary goal of mindfulness practice is said to be insight or wisdom. Uh, when we're, you know, something arises in us and we're not struggling against it right away, there's more chance for learning, right? And at the same time, if something arises in us, and we're not like falling into it completely right away, like I'm such an angry person, I will be forever. There's a lot more room for learning. So mindfulness is all about relationship and it's establishing a relationship to our experience so that insight can flower. Um, one of the things we have insight into, just because it happens to be the way it is, is connection or interconnection. Uh, the way we perceive self and other and us and them, we see as a construct. That's an insight. We see that we do live in an interdependent universe, that uh, everybody does matter, even if we don't like everybody or anybody. You know, that, that we live as part of a network as well as an individual. That's true. And so the more we see that just in the course of developing insight, the more loving kindness will come all by itself, you know, but you may also have insights into all kinds of other things. Um, and that's really what the mindfulness practice is designed for. And loving kindness practice is really designed uh, to, first of all, it's an antidote to fear. Um, and it's, it's about inclusion in attention and really broadening the way we pay attention. You know, what do we pay attention to? Who do we pay attention to? Uh, what's the quality of that attention? And the primary um, purpose of it or, or benefit will be the experience of loving kindness. It, it's really a, it's a different way of, of being. It's like, just as an example, friends of mine who are performers tell me that uh, one in particular had terrible stage fright. And so she would commonly get up on the stage and she'd look out at those people, you know, who she knew were just sitting there waiting to judge her mercilessly and really be afraid of them and really dislike them. And then she'd get more and more uptight. So there was this huge sense of like the other is out there just waiting to get me, right? So she got in the habit of getting up on the stage and doing loving kindness practice. And then it was different. It wasn't that she, you know, got sloppy or, or didn't care anymore, but there, wasn't a, there was almost a sense like, okay, we're here together. 
And I know that even uh, if one makes a mistake in that kind of atmosphere, it's different, right? It's, it's a different sense of connection. It's a different sense of community. So that would be where loving kindness practice goes. W along the way, there's a lot of insight. It just happens because you're paying attention, right? And you're also stretching your attention. So you see, ooh, you know, like, I didn't know that um, I had this power of love, or I didn't know that this was arising in me and I'd pull back because I was so embarrassed, or I didn't know that uh, this person who, whom I really don't like is not just the enemy. You know, I used to spend all my time when I'm thinking about them going through the same list of their faults. It wasn't like I found new faults, like just the same list again and again and again. Look what happens when I actually broaden my attention. I still think they're not that great in all those arenas, but look at that. There's also this. Or what if this, somebody told me this story um, after I'd written uh, my most recent book about work, and, and uh, she said that um, she uh, got into the habit of starting meetings just by silently looking at everybody in the room and reminding herself, you know, everybody here wants to be happy. Everybody actually wants to be happy. They might have different definitions or ways of approaching it, but everybody actually wants to be happy. You know, so it's something like that. Um, so certainly they're insights, and we utilize them from loving kindness practices. It's just uh, the main emphasis is different. And I think it's great to do both. You know, it's not like an either or. Uh, in terms of methodology, a lot of people do both and they just experiment. These days, like when I sit, which is every day, um, which we can talk about, <laughs> uh, my practice, my formal practice is really mindfulness practice, but I have a commitment to do loving kindness practice whenever I'm waiting and I count every mode of transportation as waiting. So every airplane, every taxi, walking down the streets of New York, I silently <laughs> keep repeating those phrases for myself or for someone I'm encountering. And uh, it's so much more fun than what I'm usually doing on an airplane, whatever that is. And uh, it, it's a whole other way of being. And it's all, you think about all those times during the day when we're just kind of filling in the time and think about not doing that, but actually doing some loving kindness practice. There are lots of ways of bringing them together. Do you want... Uh... Yeah, we can jump into some others. And <clears throat> for part of this more conversational part about the application of sort of this kind of meditation, um, it's really important you guys feel comfortable sort of joining in the conversation. So if you want to take the conversation a certain direction, uh, feel free, and uh, uh, we can do that. But I'd like to throw one more question in about the actual mechanics of the practice itself. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been on <coughs> heart practice retreats, and there's someone in the corner who's getting over some childhood trauma and really having a breakthrough and very obviously being really emotional about it. I think it's easy to have an expectation with this practice of having a strong emotional response. Can you speak to the idea of what, what should one expect while you're doing this sort of thing? Um, the question was, what should one expect while doing a heart-centered practice? Well, I think that's a fascinating question anyway, and I think it's crucial in terms of being able to continue a practice. So, uh, you know, I said that when I first came back from India, if I'd be at some social situation, People would say to me, what do you do? And I said, I say, I teach meditation. They were kind of go, ew. Um, well, nowadays, the single most common response I hear is, I'm so stressed out, I could use some of that. Or I hear what I, what I find very amusing, uh, my partner should really meet you. They could really <laughs> use some of that. <laughs> or I hear, uh, I tried it once, I failed at it. I tried to meditate, I couldn't do it. And they then describe what, obviously what they expected to have happen. I failed at it because I couldn't stop my thinking, I couldn't have only beautiful thoughts, I couldn't keep sleepiness at bay, I couldn't stop from being restless, whatever it is. And 
uh, you know, from the point of view of, of meditation, none of that is why we meditate. You're not going to stop your thoughts. You're not going to make your mind blank. You're not going to have only beautiful thoughts, but you can change your relationship to everything, right? That's the power we have. And um, to beautiful experiences, to painful experiences, all of it. And so with loving kindness, there, there, its own set of expectations. Either I should have beautiful feeling and wonderful, uh, I should float away, I should forgive myself totally by this afternoon. I've put in 20 minutes, you know, it should be over. Um, or I should have this kind of huge catharsis. Uh, I should feel this kind of gooey, light, uh, warm feeling toward everybody. And it's especially funny, my first book was called Loving Kindness. And it's all about doing loving kindness meditation. And after that, people used to say to me, um, what's it like to love everybody all the time, <laughs> without exception, without hesitation? And I go, huh. I mean, I wrote a book on it, but it doesn't mean I'm like perfect at it. And so those expectations are, are very important to uh, acknowledge, you know, to, to recognize and, and bring forth. And, I guarantee you, you can do loving kindness practice uh, in an ardent, useful, transformative way and not have any emotion happening. You really can. It's not that it never happens, you know, but I, mean, I see from my own experience and from teaching thousands of people this kind of practice, um, it's something deeper than the level of emotion and sometimes it will translate as emotion and sometimes it won't. So my signature story about loving kindness practices, the first month we moved into the Insight Meditation Society um, in 1976, we didn't have any programming for a month. So those of us who were there decided I oh, will just sit ourselves. And I'd always wanted to do loving kindness practice. Uh, and I'd always done a little bit here and there, but never systematically. So. I had a month and I knew you started with yourself and then you moved on to these categories. So I spent the whole first week doing loving kindness practice for myself and I felt absolutely nothing. It was like a completely dreary week. And then at the end of the week, several of us had to leave suddenly because something happened to a friend of ours in Boston. So I was getting ready to leave the retreat and I was up in one of the bathrooms and I dropped this big jar of something on the tile floor. And the jar just went down and shattered and the stuff went everywhere. And I noticed the first thought that came up in my mind was, you are really a klutz, but I love you. <laughs> and I thought, look at that. <laughs> you could have given me anything and I could not have honestly said something was happening during that week, but something was happening. And I've seen that thousands of times, which is one of the reasons it's difficult for people to continue their meditation practice is because I think we tend to look in the wrong place for results. We need to look at our lives, not necessarily at that 20 minute period a day where we may not have the great breakthrough or float away or whatever it is, but we will be different. So let's, let's talk about the practical applications of compassion. So does compassion make you a sucker? What about assholes? <laughs> <laughs> Do I need to repeat that? <laughs> no, yeah. This means the YouTube video might get a, a you know, parental warning. Okay. <laughs> no, it does not make you a sucker. I mean, that is one of the great, uh, it's of great interest to me having this conversation. Because um, that, of course, is what we think, that you're going to be too nice, you're going to give too much, you're going to get exhausted. Um, but I think a very rigorous investigation, and certainly in a personal experiential level of compassion, shows us it's not the same thing as being um, devastated by someone's situation. Because then we have, we're just exhausted. We have nothing to give, right? Uh, years ago, I was teaching in the Soviet Union, um, it was still the Soviet Union, and uh, I'd gone with my friend Joseph Goldstein in a, a tour group because you couldn't go. and apart from that in those days. And every afternoon, Joseph and I would disappear instead of going to look at some museum. And we'd go to someone's house to teach and with a translator. And uh, 
I was talking a lot about compassion, and I noticed that um, every time I did that, I'd just get a sense of like a really funny feeling in the room. And finally, I said to the translator, when I say compassion, what do you say? And they said, oh, you know, it's the state where you feel like broken by the suffering and nearly destroyed by the suffering. And it's like <laughs> someone has taken a giant stake and driven it through your heart. And I thought, well, no wonder there's a really funny feeling in the room. It seems very Russian. Yes, it is very Russian. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we can go there and imagine that that's compassion, where that is more like devastation. Or we can think, oh, I'm just going to give in too much. I'm going to be too nice. So the way we usually um, distinguish it is uh, going back to what I sort of said before, that loving kindness and compassion affect our field of motivation. It's why we do things. It isn't necessarily going to determine what we do, right? We might be coming from a genuinely loving and compassionate place, but our a uh, sense of discernment in a particular situation, in a particular context, might be that we need to say no. We need to be fierce. We need to be kind of intense. Um, and that's going to be based on, on wisdom, you know, on, on, it's like our best guess of what's most appropriate in that context. But we don't have to be coming from a hateful place. Um. <laughs> A big part of practices is working on yourself. And certainly something we hear for people that, that take some of the classes we have here is like, wow, it's a really amazing class. And then sometimes when it seems like when I go out into the world, it's, a, it's an environment that's, that's, that's a little hostile to that. Particularly with regard to compassion practice, what are your thoughts around the work with yourself as it relates to other people? Like, so for instance, if there's an a, um, imp impedance mismatch, between you and the, and the people around you. How do you skillfully negotiate that? Uh, you mean in the sense that um, people are not responsive to your compassion? Right, or, or operating, or for instance, you're operating in a compassionate way, and then maybe the group mores are, are, are less compassionate. Okay, so if you're coming from a compa what about if you're coming from a compassionate place and the, the kind of culture you're operating in is not so much that way? Um, it happens, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, I think we can, um, again, you know, going back to what I was just saying, I think it's clarifying our intention, which doesn't have to become the lowest common denominator. You know, we don't have to live uh, as driven and, um, confused as the people around us may be. And yet, uh, there's more or less skillful means of expression that we, uh, we do the best we can to develop as skillful a way of communicating as possible. So instead of saying, you know, you're all losers and you have no heart and you're pathetic, you know, there might be a better way of saying that. <laughs> um, and uh, really being, um, very truthful about that, but not in a way that is putting down others. So for example, um, one of the things I think about these days is uh, I really believe we live more and more in a culture of being taught that you will feel better about yourself by demeaning others. And that if you can put others down, you're going to feel better. Um, uh, years ago, a friend and I were watching the Winter Olympics, and this couple got up and s executed this dance on ice. And then at the instant they stopped, it seemed like without even drawing breath, the commentator barked out, lacks artistry. And my friend and I were like rolling on the floor. It was like, give me a break. These people just danced on ice. You know, it's like not easy. But it's just, you know, that's how it is. It's like, um, and I, I don't think we need to buy into that because the more we live like that, the more alone we feel, threatened by someone else's success, even if it, it's not taking anything away from us. Uh, like we're an endless competition, not just the people we're competing at, with you know, or against, but we're you know, constantly in this state of feeling ripped off by someone, what else, someone else is enjoying. And um, it's not that fulfilling or happy a place to be. And we don't need to buy into it. 
but we don't need to, you know, be contem condemning in a sort of uh, nasty way. Like I am, you know, I am the one who understands how to speak to people, whereas you people don't. Uh, but it actually makes a difference. I really believe in um, what I learned, a phrase I learned from uh, this group of women who were running domestic violence shelters uh, that I was teaching. Uh, where they themselves came up with this phrase, a culture of wellness, that they wanted to start to try to bring forth. Um, and I think it makes a difference. One of the things about meditation practice is that it can be really useful during times of emotional distress or difficulty. And I think that's also the hardest time to practice in a lot of ways. Like, let's really get focused and pay attention onto the degree of misery I'm experiencing right now. Uh, any thoughts on being with the practice during that time, and in particular, any role that compassion practice might play in those sorts of situations? Um, let's look at the degree of misery I'm experiencing. <laughs> that was great. Um, I think there are a few things. One is, uh, that's one reason why I think it's good to practice in ordinary times. Uh, it's like building up resource and strength and, and capacity. Um, I was once interviewed for Good Housekeeping magazine, which if you'd ever seen my house, you would find as amusing as my friends. Uh, it was really funny. And the, my part of the interview didn't make it into the magazine, not because they saw my house, but just <laughs> didn't. So the question was something like, how do you use mindfulness in a time of complete crisis? And my answer was, it was one of those experiences, you know, where you just hear words come out of your mouth. So what I heard come out of my mouth was, I wouldn't wait. Like, don't wait. Sometimes people do, and even then it can be useful. But if you don't, if you're, you know, just having kind of the ordinary day, ordinary pressures, whatever it might be, that's the time to really be building um, all of those skills because you'll use them in much more difficult times and even much more joyous times, um, you know, to appreciate them and really be there for them. And so don't wait. And if you have waited or uh, you feel overcome, even if you've got an experience in practice, I think compassion practice is a perfect thing to do in those times because um, it's very difficult to extend compassion toward ourselves. That feels like weakness. Like somebody, I was teaching recently somewhere, and, and uh, I think even that moment, like if you're doing breath meditation where you have to let go of the distraction, come back as a moment of compassion for yourself uh, and forgiveness for yourself so you can start over. And somebody really objected to that. They said, well, that's just being weak, and if I forgive myself, it's like I'm gonna it's like giving myself permission to do it again. Um, but I don't really think so. I think if you do a kind of thought experiment about what that's like, you make a mistake, you realize it, you feel the pain or discomfort of that, you resolve to be different, you let go, you go on. That's one thing. And to just go over it and 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 over it, and over it is not a really useful way to have the energy to go on. So. I don't know that it's that, uh, it's not gonna help us accomplish anything. Your new book is called uh, Happiness at Work, and certainly if you've seen any of the studies or metrics around happiness in, in the workplace, it's sort of a, a, a book that, that needed writing. <laughs> um, one of the things that it's interesting to us, and by interesting to us I mean something that's hard and, and challenging for us, is the concept of detaching from work. Um, I think a lot of people that work here are very emotionally invested um, in the work we do. And I think working here feels a lot like working at, at NASA in the 1960s, like being at a, at a very special place and, and, and time doing really cool work. And it's not sustainable, you know, to be doing email at 10, 11 uh, at night. Uh, What's your take on the way that practices can actually support uh, detaching from work, even if it's work that you love? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, first of all, it's work that you love. You are very, very blessed. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a tremendous uh, blessing in one's life. And 
and still we just need some uh, repose, you know, and uh, because in fact we are not our jobs. I, I put that in the book, which is actually called Real Happiness at Work, and um, when I started doing interviews for the book, that was, people were very confounded by that, kind of like, what do you mean we're not our jobs? Or, you know, just like when I described myself at those parties, you know, somebody would say, what do you do, right? Which is what we say, instead of, um, what makes you happy? <laughs> or, uh, what was your favorite experience of the week? You know, it's like, what do you do? Uh, we're all taught to identify with that role, and it's great to be invested in, I think, and to really care, and it's not all that we are. And so um, I think even just ritualizing uh, whatever it might be, it's like the great experiment of life. I'm not going to check email after whatever. Um, I just quoted Linda Stone, you know, in, in coining the phrase email apnea, uh, which is very interesting, you know. Check it out next time you're doing email. Are you breathing? Isn't that interesting that there's actually a thing like that? Uh, where our breath can get so shallow when we're doing email that we are barely breathing with all the attendant consequences of that. Um, ritualizing pauses, stepping back, uh, taking a breath during the day or periods of time where we're not constantly on, um, just to have like a better balance. Something else in the book that I thought was really relevant to this, to this group is also the, the idea or maybe the myth of, of multitasking. Uh, what ways do you think mindfulness can support um, uh, being involved less in, in, in you know, oh, I'll, it's called multitasking, but fast and inefficient context switching. <laughs> Ooh, I like that, fast and inefficient context switching. Uh, well, as I'm sure you know, studies show that, uh, in fact, when we're multitasking, we're not that effective and efficient, which is why we do it. We think it's really going to uh, bring us far. And I think one of the things about mindfulness exercises that you can bring into your workplace or into your life is that they can seem very simplistic, but they actually work. You know, just like ritualizing that pause or that moment uh, before taking action. Like when I was first living in India, um, you know, nobody had a job and people weren't raising families then and uh, we weren't really doing anything, but still it was not that easy to have a practice and during conversation or in the visa office or whatever it was. Um, and so we would always ask our teachers, you know, what should we do? And, and the recommendations I thought were so simplistic, like feel your feet against the floor or take a breath before you respond to the visa officer. And I think it's so stupid. Uh, but actually doing it makes a difference. Look at that. Um, things like Thich Nhat Hanh's famous suggestion, don't pick up the phone on the first ring. Let it ring three times and breathe. You know, it's not going to take such a huge amount of time, but it just helps you kind of come back and then you start again. So uh, in terms of mindfulness and multitasking, it might be just one thing, you know, like drink a cup of tea or coffee and just do that. It's not going to take forever. You don't have to worry about not getting your list done. But rather than drink the cup of tea and check your email and be on the conference call and have something else going on at the same time, uh, you know, take a few moments and just do that fully and then see what happens. As a follow-up to one of those last questions, um, you know, we talk a lot about um, getting into flow experiences at work, you know, and getting totally absorbed in what you're doing. And um, it almost seems like that's a look, that's a very different skill and a different experience to being mindful. And I'm wondering, like. Is there such a thing as too much flow? How do you balance flow and mindfulness? Mm -hmm. So how do you balance flow and mindfulness? I think they're actually connected um, in that mindfulness uh, doesn't need to be, and as it's practiced, you know, it doesn't need to be like so labored or stylized or effortful. It really becomes this kind of flow. Uh, and I also think that sometimes what we think is flow is just kind of distraction. 
um, if if we're not if it's not born out of a, a kind of attention, you know, or interest or uh, some powerful passion for what we're doing, then um, we know we're just kind of drifting. But we think it's like I, you know, we often use this example um, as a joke of like a, a typical five or ten or fifteen minutes in a meditator's mind where you're sitting and maybe you're with the breath and then you think um, I wonder wh where I should go for dinner and then you think well you know it would be good to be to get a vegetarian meal I mean I spent you know the whole afternoon meditating and after all and then you think well you know I think I'll be a vegetarian from <laughs> now on that would be really healthy and it's better for the planet and it's more in line with my moral values and then you think you know, it's hard to be a vegetarian without really know how, knowing how to be a good cook because you end up, you have to eat out all the time, you just, you know, you don't get good food, so I better, I better really learn how to cook. And then you think, what time does that bookstore close? Maybe, you know, I can run there and I can buy all these vegetarian cookbooks and then I can be a great vegetarian because I'm a great cook. And then you think, while I'm in the bookstore, I think I'll go to the travel section because I need to find a book to plan my next vacation. Like, should I go to Mexico? Should I go to Canada? Oh, I know, now I'm a vegetarian and I meditate. I'll go to India. <laughs> and we kind of wake up walking down the streets of New Delhi and the last thing we remember thinking is, I wonder where I should go for dinner, <laughs> right? So we've kind of floated away on that sea of associative thinking, but it's not really the same thing, of course, as a flow state, you know, which is much more completely unified. And so uh, we need mindfulness, I think, almost to know the difference. Um, and mindfulness will, will move into that, you know, more and more. Um, so is this working? Yeah. Yes. So I guess uh, during periods of my life, I've had a couple periods of my life where I much better about mindfulness, and even intensively so for short periods. And what one of my concerns I've had is that it sort of cultivates this level of what I call softness mm -hmm. in myself that almost doesn't feel like it has a place in my work life. Like, like it almost that sort of softness when I, if I was to bring it to my to my work life, I feel very vulnerable in a way that, that doesn't feel. So I'm wondering if, if that makes any sense to you or you have any advice for how to navigate that potential fear I have. Uh, so you feel that kind of softness or vulnerability in terms of relationships with others or that you would be too um, revealing? Well, I, I think that, I guess, maybe based on models I see around me, it just seems so different. And some of the way I, I sometimes want to carry myself seems so different from what I see in pop culture and what I see in, in other other companies, for example, that I just feel abnormal. It feels like it would be abnormal to bring that kind of tone. And I try to anyway, but um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I guess it's a fear that I have based on a cognition about what's what's expected in the in the modern world. Well, I think yes, it's really. Uh, it can be really, really tough, and and for people who work here, obviously, you're very lucky, you know. Um, but uh, I think it, it's also it's interesting. Um, sometimes it's interesting to be brave, you know, and just to see uh, what happens and how much of it is our own apprehension and how much of it, again, you know, things need to be expressed as skillfully as as possible, but. Um, Sometimes, I, I mean, I've seen that situation, you know, uh, in different kinds of settings. And, and in some surprising ways, sometimes there's actually gratitude that happens. I mean, again, if you're not, not if you're preachy and not if you're um, uh, losing an edge of creativity, you know, or uh, engagement, but you don't have to. Um, you can be coming from a a different place. And I've just seen lots of times when someone in a group, a, a collective, is really grateful for somebody pointing out, like, just their being. 
uh, uh, maybe we don't have to do that, or I don't have to do that, or I can't bear to do that, you know, uh, in some way. I'm going to have to uh, try it in this way or, or try this direction. That's how things change, really, is, is I think by one person, you know, being able to, to be authentic in, in some way. To add to that. Yeah. Um, also, I think that being vulnerable and displaying vulnerability is something you can play with from a leadership perspective. Strategic use of vulnerability can be really powerful, right? You don't want to, you know, come over like a shambling wreck, you know? Um, but to actually let someone behind the scenes, even in a leadership position, is extraordinarily powerful if you do it strategically. So advice would be look for opportunities to, particularly with people you feel safe for, to play with that edge, right? And you may find out that the censorship is coming more from inside, like the calls from inside the house, rather than the, what, the, what the reaction of other people will necessarily be. Cool. I got a fun one. Yeah. So the, one of the reasons why I'm so grateful that Sharon is spending the afternoon with us is if you look at what's going on with like mindfulness and meditation and some of you may be going to Wisdom 2.0 this weekend or saw Time Magazine or maybe even friends or relatives or you're asking you about this thing if they know you're into it. Um, it wasn't always that way. It's a really recent phenomenon and one of the things I'm very grateful for for Sharon is you know she's one of the OG original gangsters who who took these practices in the, in the late 60s, early 70s, and thought, wow, these might actually work in the US. And I think to actually, to arrive at that conclusion in 1971, like is sort of a hell of a thing. Yeah. And especially to be here, you know, so could you have imagined, it's 1971, everyone's wearing bell bottoms, sideburns, big hair, <laughs> that one day that mindfulness would be sort of the buzzword and what do you think of the positives of that and what are some of the negatives of that and are you like how does it feel like how, what's that like oh and also thank you for doing that whole bringing it here thing oh yeah thank you <laughs> <laughs> um, I got a new new uh, phrase an OG. OG yeah OG <laughs> original gangster wow um, no, I never, ever, ever would have imagined. None of us did. And I have to say, honestly, that uh, our coming back, well, I told you the story about Deepa Ma telling me to teach. You know, it wasn't like we had a strategic plan uh, or even much of a vision. You know, we, Joseph Goldstein and Jack Cornfield and I began teaching together, and um, we would respond to invitations, and somebody would write and say, I can get together some friends and a cook. Will you come? teach a retreat and we teach that retreat and at the end of the retreat we never knew if there'd be another retreat and then another letter would come and uh, one day someone else suggested we start the retreat center the insight meditation society and we did we moved in on valentine's day of 1976 and honestly our our mantra for the entire first year was we can always close in a year we'll just close it in a year if it doesn't work if no one wants to learn how to meditate we'll just close it in a year and we couldn't get a mortgage. Um, the property, which, uh, have any of you been there, by the way? Sorry. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's a great retreat center in Barry, Massachusetts. And it, it's a big building. It was a novitiate when we bought it. So it's kind of like this institutional building that can sleep about 100 uh, retreatants plus staff, about 20 staff people. and. Um, 80 acres of land, and it cost us $150,000 in 1976, which we didn't have. So uh, we raised $50,000. The Fathers of the Blessed Sacrament, which were running it, they gave us a $50,000 mortgage, and we couldn't get a mortgage from the bank. So these three people had to personally co-sign a loan for the money for the other $50,000. And so they didn't like it much when we kept saying, we can close it in a year. <laughs> we'll just close it in a year, because they would have lost their money. Um, but we didn't know. I mean, there was no sense. And it wasn't, it really wasn't strategic. The practices had meant so much to each of us. And it seemed like an important thing to try to convey. And uh, retreats were tiny. And we were grateful anybody showed up. And um, 
and very slowly things really began to change. I never would have imagined this, and I think it's great. You know, I think that uh, if people are going to reach for something to try to make their lives better or uh, the situation around them better, like why not? You know, it's it's a series of skills and. Uh, one of the, I am very method oriented, um, as you can probably tell, and one of the reasons is because I think that's what sets us free. It's like the method is what we can do on our own and uh, really develop and cultivate this kind of understanding. And um, I think it's terrific, and it's going to be everything. You know, it's already everything uh, from, you know, ashtrays to to whatever, you know, it's everything. And uh, there are people who are going to practice for all kinds of different reasons. I mean, that was an interesting question, which we started talking about earlier. Uh, you know, when I wanted to learn how to practice, I was 18 years old. I was going to school in Buffalo, New York, and I had to get myself to India. So that was like a strong motivation to really learn a practice. I had done a lot of internal work just in getting to India, you know, and like, uh, moving. I'd never even been to California when I went to India. And, and these days it's, it's not, you don't have to have that kind of really intense motivation. You just have to go to a bookstore or, you know, have a friend who, who heard about it or work in a certain place. And it's going to be different. So it's, it's very intriguing just to see how it will evolve. Mm, cool. So speaking of, uh, of bookstores, some of the folks from the East West Bookstore in Mountain View are in the back and they have um, copies of Sharon's book available as well as some other ones. And it's my understanding that in addition to offering this wisdom in the form of dead trees, that they also can, uh, uh, you can also purchase electronic versions for, uh, for your readers there. So if that's uh, of interest to you, it's right there. With that? I think so. So, hey, thank you all so much. It was really yeah. great to have an opportunity to spend an afternoon of sort of practice and chatting. And I hope it was uh, valuable for you. And thank you very much. And thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Lindsay, for putting this all together. And thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much. My pleasure.